Well, please give a warm welcome to Dominic Sessa, writer David Hemmingson, and director Alexander Payne. Warm response. Thanks a lot. I'm Alexander. That's David. That's hey, how Dominic. Are you? Hello. I love walking through a door and have this has never happened before. You walk through a door, people applaud like this. This is well, great. Thank and you. On a, and on a Sunday morning, like church. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for yeah. for coming. You're, I'll tell you in front of everybody, you're one of the directors I admire the most. Um, you make things look so easy, but you've put so much work behind this film. I, I, when, I, when I introduced the film, I did not mention that this is the first time that you do a period film, but it's not technically a period film. You make it, you filmed as if the movie was being made in the 1970s. Right, it, it's a contemporary film from 1970. And <laughs> which is, uh, can you tell us about why do it go, go with that right? It just I thought it would make it fun and special, and you know, you want to do something formally interesting along with you know along with telling the story. You want to do something formally interesting. You know, ten years ago I made a movie in black and white. I thought that would be interesting. This one is interesting because it's we. I wanted to make it look and sound like a movie. You know, not a hundred percent, but maybe seventy percent of the way like a movie made made in 1970. I'm glad you brought up sound. Um, the, the, you capture the camera perspective in the sound and also the acoustics in the room? Well, as much as possible. I mean, nowadays, they, they uh, location sound mixers tend to both boom and wire the actors uh, for sound. And I just hate that. I don't like it to the, that close sound. And you watch movies these days, and a lot of them sound, to me, at least to me, sound like radio shows, yeah. more than like a movie where you can feel the room and get the perspective of the camera, like you used to feel. So I wanted to do that. There were a couple scenes where I had to wire the actors, you know, when they're walking across the street or something. But in general, it's all with uh, with old mics and booms. And the last nerdy question, um, you used the solves in this movie, and it's such a beautiful editing choice. It, it's melancholic. It, it, it well, to be, f I mean, thank you. And to be fair, all the films that I've uh, edited together with Kevin Tent, my editor, we've done eight feature films together. We love dissolves. All of our movies have dissolves and but It's wipes. not widely used anymore. Well, you have to ask those other directors about that, their choices. <laughs> but for us, we, we always like dissolves, and we don't know why other people don't use them, because they're so pretty. Um, and David, um, you know, tell us about uh, being commissioned by, by Alexander to write the script. How did it come about? It was, um, Alexander had read a pilot, a television pilot that I wrote some years ago called Stonehaven. And it was very much the story of me going to this prep school in, in Connecticut, and highly autobiographical, like 90% autobiographical. And I wrote it. Um, I've been working network television for quite a while, and I kind of wanted to do something that was deeply personal. And I did it. My my a agent, uh, who has the I think the best taste and the worst bedside manner in Hollywood, uh, read it, and he said, "I love this. This is very evocative and interesting, and it seems very personal to you, and it's useless to me, and I can't sell it. And what are we going to do with this?" this that was is, Matt. That said was Matt. That. Yeah, Matt said that. So I was like, oh, thanks, man. That's very kind of you. Uh, and so he sort of hung on to it. And, but he was wise enough to get it to a, a friend, now a mutual friend of ours, Niels Mueller, who got it to Alexander. And so he called me kind of out of the blue. I did not know. And I was, I'd been shooting a TV show in Prague, and I was dog tired to the point of delirium. And this phone call came through. And it said, hi, David Hemmings, Alexander Payne. And I thought it was my friend Bob playing a trick on me. Because he would often call me up and say things like, Dave Hemmingson, uh, Francis Ford Coppola. And I would buy it and sort of like stammer a hello. And he'd say, you're an idiot. Let's get a beer. So I thought this was, I thought it was a prank. And then I kind of looked at the Omaha area code and figured out it was, in fact, this man here. Um, and so we started talking. And he said, I like your TV show, but I don't want to make the pilot. I want you to write a movie for me in the same world. And, and The Holdovers was born. That was sort of the birthday of The Holdovers. And... Um, we started working from that point onward. And it's loosely based on 
Marcel Pagnol's La Merluse. Uh, did you watch? No, I really didn't study the film. I just sort of got the log line from, from AP, which was... I just, took, I just told him the premise of yeah. the movie. Yeah. Te teacher with wonky eye takes care of boys... <laughs> with nowhere to go at Christmas break, develop special relationship with one of them. That's it. That's what I had. So I didn't study the film. But what I did was I just sort of went, OK, that's a great jumping off point. And, and so started working on the story. And he's a brilliant writer and a wonderful collaborator. And so I would just sort of like send an act at a time sometimes. And he would have thoughts. And we kind of bat it back and forth. And within about 18 months, we had, we had the movie. And then it was about a lot of fine tuning. And then Paul Giamatti was mentioned very early on as well. So, you know, it was probably our second conversation uh, was, how do you feel about Paul Giamatti? And I said, I think he's magnificent. And he said, would you write it for him? And I said, in a heartbeat. And so here we are. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, Alexander, your Academy Award winner is screenwriter. Why not write the, the movie yourself? What was it about David? I thought he'd be better than I would be to, because he had had that life experience. I, I didn't go to a private school. I mean, I did. I went to an all-boys Jesuit school in Omaha, but I, ha I hadn't. I hadn't had that. I hadn't had that. Um, you know, New England boarding school thing, and nor had he. I mean, he went to a private school, but as a day student, not as a boarder. But he was kind of much more from that world. He, like Paul Giamatti, he's born and raised in New Haven, Connecticut. Like Paul Giamatti, they both went to Yale. Paul went to Choate. So when Paul went to you know, to take the part, he said he really knew how to play the part because he had had teachers like that. And the strangest thing was I found out when I graduated <clears throat> from college that our dads knew each other. Paul's dad and my dad went to college together. And, and Paul's dad was the, I'm sorry, yeah, Paul's dad was the president of Yale, Bart Giamatti. And so when I met him on my graduation day, he said, I remember your father, class of 1960. We were in a Chaucer seminar together. So I feel like it was almost kismet. It was almost fate that, that uh, Paul and I should work together. So this is kind of, it's a dream come true to work with him and to work with Dom and to have this movie, you know, come out as beautifully as it did. Thank you for that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> Dominic, this is the first time you see the film. He was actually in the audience with you guys, by the way. And this is... Sneakily. It's the first time you see the film with an audience. What, what was, how, how was it? How did you feel? Well, it's actually not the first time I've seen it with an audience. I got to see it with some of my friends from college, but that was a bit distracting, so I was able to focus a, li a, little, bit, a little bit more this time. And uh, yeah, it was a very surreal experience, you know, to, to see your first project on a screen like that. Um, and this is your first film introducing Dominic. Um, you know, tell us about um, how you got cast, the Deerfield uh, graduate. Yeah, so I was a senior at Deerfield when I started this audition process, one of the locations in the movie. And um, basically, uh, the casting people came through and mainly, from what I was told, were looking for like background kids to be in the classrooms and stuff like that. But I didn't know at that point that they're still up in the air about this person who would be the, the main kid with uh, Paul. So yeah, I mean, I walked in, and I guess there was something they liked about me. I, my hair, I guess, is <laughs> very good hair. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, camera. but there there was something that um, they they decided to just keep me in the loop and keep me in in that process. Um, and all of them were willing to to you know help me out and I guess see if I could get to where I needed to be to to do something like this. And ultimately, they they saw something that worked, and I'm I'm really happy it worked out that way. Yeah. <laughs> And um, Alexander, speaking of making things look easy on screen, Paul Giamatti, uh, phenomenal performance. Um, you know, tell us about working once again with uh, the great Paul Giamatti. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could say more that's more interesting, more entertaining, more anecdotal. It was just great. We get along so well. And he... It's such a delight simply to watch him work. Mm -hmm. And I never worry about what he's going to do with a line, a scene, a, the part in general, because he's a great artist. You know, I give him a script to see, because I'm, I'm curious to see what he's going to do with it. Mm -hmm. and, oh. <clears throat> and our, by the way, hi, it's so nice to be up in Santa Barbara. And I think I'm going to be coming up a lot next year because it's the 20th anniversary, 20th oh, of sorry. Sideways. <laughs> <clears throat> and. 
I just supervised a new transfer from for you know from film to DCP. They had never made a digital print before, so now they have. Because I'm predicting there will be some demand for it, and we need to have a couple celebrations up here in town. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of back back to the Arlington, let's go to the Arlington. Back to the Arlington where we we did the Q and A. Um, speaking of sideways, there is uh, I notice a little statue in in Paul's desk. Um, is that the same statue yes. from, from yes. Sideways? Correct, yes, it's a, a, a replica of Cycladic art from like, the, like 2300 BC in the uh, Cycladic Islands. Um, so I always, I, that was in Miles' apartment here in Santa Barbara and then for Sideways then I put it in his apartment, just a little in joke, thanks for picking up on it. Uh -huh. yeah. For a while, I, th I had to watch it again today because at Telluride, I was like, is that it? Uh, yeah. So I had to. Um, um, d tell us about uh, writing the character that is played by Divine uh, Joy. It's, it's such a fact. I'm yeah. sorry? Mary? Yeah. yeah. Mary. Um, you know, it's funny because my, I was raised by a, um, a single mom who was a nurse. who's an RN. And we, I come from kind of a lower middle class background. My dad left school when he was 15 and went to, he was a merchant marine in World War II at the age of 15 and came back and went to college in the GI Bell when he was like 27, 12 years, I'd say. So I came from this very sort of um, lower middle class um, background and my mom would get up at quarter four in the morning uh, after my parents split up quite acrimoniously and she would um, have to get up and go to work and then she did that so she could be at home uh, in time to make me dinner. So she was ferociously de dedicated to me and we were very, very close. And she died kind of tragically about 25 years ago. But for me, I just kept thinking to myself, like that emotional kind of dedication, that sort of unswerving maternal dedication that I had experienced firsthand. And I really wanted to honor that and I wanted to commemorate that somehow. And I thought to myself, what would it have been like for her to lose me? You know, because I was trying to anchor this both in the period and I was also trying to give some depth and richness to the character because I wanted to be almost like the Donatondo. I wanted to be like this holy family of these three people together, you know, at Christmas. So I just sort of mined my mother's kind of emotional truth and her immense strength and I think her capacity to withstand things in the teeth of difficult circumstances and grief, you know. Uh, and I kind of put that all into Mary. And then I started looking around when I was a kid. My uncles were janitors at Wesleyan and uh, at the courthouse in Middletown, Connecticut. And I noticed that I'm too young to have gone to Vietnam, but I noticed that the um, older brothers of the kids that I knew and their uncles were going, and they were mostly poor kids, and they were you know, both white and black poor kids. And I thought to myself, okay, did some research into that and discovered the degree to which uh, young black men were being sent uh, disproportionately. And also, frontline battlefield casualties, 23% were uh, African-American men, and they were only like you know, 11% of the population. So I was like, this is, this is credible. So my whole thing was get the emotional truth, get the historical truth, combine the two, and, f and luckily we found this absolutely brilliant actor in Davine who's, I don't know about you guys, but I think she was just incredible. <laughs> incredible in this film. That's, that's, that's sort of the origin story. You have a knack for casting comic actors that, that, that bring the drama in. Is that something that you keep an eye out for? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> When I have parts which are, I mean, all the parts in my films are, you have to kind of do both, comedy and drama. But if, the, if it's a little bit more weighted toward the drama side, I make sure I've got actors with comic chops in those parts. Because then they can do the drama, but also keep it buoyant, keep a rhythm, keep it from being dreary. And, and David, was that always in the writing? She has so many layers. She's like an onion. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think when you're blessed with a great actor uh, in a role like that, you write it and you hope that they can discover the depth and, depth and this guy's a brilliant director. So it's like the two of them together, you know, it's like the chocolate, the peanut butter, the peanut butter and the chocolate. It just kind of works, you know? <laughs> it just kind of works. It's like a Reese's peanut butter cup. But it, it just sort of all came together and I tried very much to add as much dimension. And, and the character Paul also is based on my uncle who was also a World War II vet. And so a lot of the lines that, that he spouts, like, you know, Sex is 99% friction, 1% goodwill. You know, that's, that was him talking to me when I was like 11 years old. <laughs> so and I was like, I was raised in this very weird Dickensian situation, you know? So I, I just poured it all into Paul Giamatti and into, into Mary. And uh, Dominic, uh, so you'd act in, in theater, but you'd never acted in front of the camera. Uh, tell us, walk us through that experience. Uh, 
Yeah, it's a dif difficult transition, um, especially as a young person, young actor working around these people who have all of this experience, um, you know, from, from my eyes. But uh, yeah, I think the hardest thing definitely is just the, the immediacy of it. I thought when you're doing something in theater, you have that, you know, that extensive rehearsal process and um, you have time to marinate on the notes that you're given and, and really think about how you're gonna apply them for rehearsal or performance coming up. But with this, it's it's really a matter of taking the time and thankfully these guys are really great at that, just helping me understand their languages as writers and filmmakers so that when given a note on set, I can do my best to kind of deliver that immediately as possible. Which he was able to do instantaneously. I mean, I'd never seen, you, you genuinely have a, a God-given talent for acting in general, but then as far as I'm concerned for film acting. It's the greatest compliment I've ever received. Well, and, and yeah, I, I stick my neck out for nobody. <laughs> but uh, no, I just hadn't seen it before. Even technically, like day one, third or fourth shot of the, your movie career ever, you had to uh, act pretending that a piece of white tape on the mat box was another character and you were able to do it. And Sometimes that's easier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got stories about it, yeah. And, then, and, and tell us, Dominic, your relationship with Paul Giamatti, working with him, you know, your first film. Yeah, I mean, he really, really took me under his wing and, and opened himself up to me um, in a lot of ways I guess I didn't really anticipate or expect going in. Um, I mean, obviously watching him him work and, and watching him work with, with Alexander like five feet away from the guys, you know, I'm never going to forget that. And it's just a master class experience. But I think the, the bigger takeaway and the stuff I'm kind of taking the future more so as I hope to keep doing this stuff is just the, the type, type of person he was on set and how he's the same person to, to pretty much everybody, uh, you know, every crew member, every cast member, doesn't matter if they were there for only one day, he would, he would take the time to get to know them and, and just, just be a pro. And that's kind of the, the biggest thing I, I learned from him. Um, Alexander, uh, working with your DP, uh, I go uh, brilled. Uh, it's terrific job. Uh, the texture um, of the film, you know, can you, you know, tell us about working with him and it was my first time working with this Danish chap, and uh, he... He's a good-looking guy. Irritatingly good-looking. <laughs> How'd you know that? Because I've seen photos of him. Yeah, you better slow him. down. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There's speed limits in Santa Barbara County. <laughs> speed bumps, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had met him during an interview process for a movie three years previously. I didn't hire him at that time, but I liked him a lot, and we kind of stayed in touch, and I thought, it'd be fun to work with that dude someday. So uh, I just sent him the script, mm -hmm. and I think I was right because of uh, his reaction to the screenplay, what he liked about the story, and uh, the questions he began asking me and beginning that discourse about what this film could look like and how we could achieve that look. And then we got along uh, terrifically on set. Also, when you hire new um, department heads, a new cinematographer, a new production designer, new, new costume designer, but especially in the camera department, camera and, and production design, it's not just who that department head is, but whom he or she brings with him. Mm -hmm. And I really liked Eigel's uh, crew. We had to hire, and then did so happily, a local gaffer and key grip in Boston, but they were wonderful. But he was able to bring his own focus puller and his own loader, and, and he introduced me to his preferred colorist fellow in New York City. And I just liked them all very much. Yeah. And he was, he, he rose to the challenge of capturing the look of a 1970s film. And I think so. And neither of us had worked in 166 before, too, the, yeah. the aspect ratio. And I would kind of wanted to just because I'm still in film school and I want to work with all the different aspect ratios. So I said, well, let me try 166 on this one. And I knew that uh, because of it, it's a more intimate story that, I mean, the narrower you go, the better close-ups you get. So I'm just, I was very happy with the close-ups in this. Mm -hmm. um, I think you addressed Very it. few close-ups, by the way. Um, you know, yeah, uh, David, navigating 
the the tone of the film. You know, one moment is it's 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 heartbreaking. The next moment is laugh out loud. It is his most emotional film to date, by the way, uh, Alexander. Your film, oh, uh. the most. Yeah, but yeah. having that tone. I mean, for me, uh, obviously, I like. It was deeply familiar. I was a this is a great experience because I was a huge fan, and I end up writing a movie for him. But for me, um, I kind of find that you know, comedy in a weird way, and drama, or even horror and, and action, like it's a, it's always a game of sort of um, increase the tension, release the tension, increase the tension, release the tension. So you know, comedy, laughter releases tension. Drama, you're leaning in, you're increasing the tension. So my goal was to sort of honestly, technically do two things. One, in the scene in which you start lying and he joins in at the hospital, that's a shameful secret and they are allowed, they now share a shameful secret, thank you. They now share a shameful secret, right? And they can start basically <coughs> revealing themselves to each other because now they have this thing, it's them against the world. And when Paul later um, lies to Hugh Cavanaugh, now he's lying and we get more backstory. And again, a shameful secret draws them even closer. So to me, it's always a question of two things. One, kind of driving the characters closer together and then creating impediments, like when he tries to leave the theater to pull them apart. And then you know, creating these moments of comedy offset by these moments of drama. And I think hopefully that it gets you to lean in. Uh, I think that's what life is. I think life is a combination of comedy and drama. You know? um, and so I just try to replicate that as much as I could on, on the page. And, um Alexander, um, you make movies that are human, that human stories. You know, they're not, they don't rely on contrivance, conceit. It's, you just tell the story of human, of human, uh, humans. Um, you know, can you tell us about your, your, your approach? You're gonna make a joke about it. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. Well, I like people. I hate them too, but I like them and they're so, <laughs> They're so interesting. And I just thought movies were supposed to be about people. What else are we supposed to make movies about? You know, some, a marble. Mar uh, marble? Uh, you know, <laughs> marble and, and. Not interested. Then again, I don't really see those movies, so I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't think I'm that, you, I mean, thank you. I'm happy to be considered that I make human movies, human humanist. Anth anthropocentric, whatever you want to call them. But uh, those are the movies I grew up watching and still watch. And I, you know, old Holly, I'm so proud of our heritage as, as Americans and our filmmaking heritage up until about 1980. <laughs> beautiful films. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, always an honor to have you here. And thank you, all three of you, thank you for very being much. here. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you, for you guys. Thanks, thanks so much. Thanks.